Hi, Steve Arderman here. Thanks for joining me for Going Deeper. And we're going to go deeper today in talking about narcissistic personality disorder. I'm hoping that you're a narcissist and you stumbled onto this. Uh, here's a book we wrote for people that love you. It's called Understanding and Loving a Person with Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Narcissism goes beyond arrogance or selfishness or egotism. egotism. It really is a total... Uh, disordered personality because of a deep, deep wound that's there. Now, in in video one, I've tried to help you identify for sure what this thing is, and then uh, in the second video, I've I've tried to help you uh, deal with it the best you can. And um, you know, uh, surrender is the beginning, really, of a spiritual life. And whenever we surrender. Uh, something we're starting to enter into the spiritual dimension with that problem and so that's what i want to lead you through here uh, as we talk about this you know um last time i talked about we need to change our thinking to the degree that we can so that our perspective is different well you know our thinking oftentimes is all about this other person and, and our thinking is focused on them, trying to minimize the symptoms or manipulate them or, or whatever. And what we want to do is we want to change our thinking to what do I need now? Man, if you've been in a 20-year relationship with a narcissist, there's not much left of you. So you might need some really great counseling. You might even need medication, an antidepressant, just to help you get through and to get by. That might be the thing that you need. Well, if that's what you need, let's let's do it. Here's something. A lot of people think that God has abandoned them. And so they quit praying and quit reading the Bible and meditating. That's something for you to do that might be different than what you've done before. So this is a, a thinking change. But it, how much more likely am I going to change my brain up here if I meditate on some biblical truths from God than if I'm not doing that? How much more am I going to change my thinking if I'm reading from God's word, even if it's just the Proverbs? It's going to be so much more likely I can change my thinking. I may need to take medication. I may need to eat some things that I've never eaten before. And I might need to quit eating some things that spike my moods up and down, may need to make some adjustments so that my thinking is as stable as it possibly can be. So when I decide not to make the whole focus on the other person because I'm surrendering this to God, then I can focus on God's truth and God's presence. And what does God want me to do? I want you to do the next right thing. What is that? Well, first of all, we have to believe that we could do the next right thing because it might be going against everything we've done or thought possible with this person. So, you know, like it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can do this, whatever this is, if you're surrendered to the Lord. And then this other person may be a really big target. The narcissist usually is a big target. And they can be such a big target that you don't work on your little target. <laughs> so we want to shift thinking from it's all about the other person to, well, whatever I need to be working on, that's what I want to do. And so uh, here's something to meditate on. Nothing can ever separate me from God's love. Nothing. Nothing can separate me from God's love. That's, that's something that you can do uh, to try to shift from thinking you're in this all alone you know you god's abandoned you no meditate on that and then you know as you surrender you're starting to see that trying harder just has made trying harder <laughs> and you don't want that so um you're surrendering you're looking to the spiritual things rather than focusing on the other person. You're focusing on God, your relationship with God. You're looking for any kind of shame that you have, that you haven't allowed Christ's uh, sacrifice on the cross to take care of that same shame. And so you're looking at the shame. And how do I deal with that? Because maybe that's how I so naively got into the relationship with this person. And this, to add insult to injury, might be the 
fourth person that's a narcissist that I've been in um, relationship with. So I, I really want to think differently as part of a new strategy, even if the other person doesn't change. But a lot of times when we start to do these things, uh, they get curious or they get fascinated by what we're doing and it kind of motivates them to evaluate weight some stuff and think through some things quite differently than ever before. Now, I want to be sure that if there is no hope that you're able to forgive yourself for being in a relationship where there's no hope, okay? So if there's no hope, you might consider um, a planned separation where you say to the person, I have got nothing left. I can't do this anymore. I just need some time to recoup. And so uh, you would do that. Consider if there's abuse, protecting yourself. Consider uh, forgiveness. Forgiving the person doesn't mean you excuse it, but them. But maybe you need to forgive yourself. You're just so hard on yourself. But here's what I want to say to you. If you are in a relationship where you don't think there's any hope for change. Um, I can't think of a, a more miserable thing to be than to be a Jew under um, in the time that, that n the Nazis led by Hitler were taking over. And... Um, one of the great writers of all time, greatest human being, one of the greatest human beings of all time, was Viktor Frankl. And uh, Viktor was, of course, he was a prisoner in uh, one of the prisoner of war camps and uh, that was, it was run by the Germans. And he survived it. And, um, well, what happened to me was on the weekend that Schindler's List came out, a great movie about Nazis in Germany and a guy that helps them. Um, on the weekend that came out, I was in Washington, D.C. I saw the movie and then I went to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And then I flew home on a plane reading uh, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And it was so powerful because here was a guy that survived the worst treatment of all. So when we, th when we start to think I am in the worst situation. In fact, I said this to my therapist one time. I'm just in the worst situation ever. And he was really good at pointing out to me it could be a lot worse. You are not in a, a Nazi concentration camp about to be killed. But Viktor Frankl was. And he talks about how he got through that and this mindset that he had. When he came out, you know, he, he certainly talked um, a lot about uh, the meaning of life and some of the things that he learned there. And um, he came up with the, what you could call uh, tragic optimism, a term tragic optimism. He developed a ther therapy called logotherapy. And in that, they talk about a tragic triad. So I'm going to adapt some of this to your situation. Because I do think that, you know, many times you feel like you're in prison. What am I going to do? And this person won't change. So you have to ask the question, or he did, certainly. Can life um, have meaning in spite of me living in like three different levels uh, where, you know, I've got guilt and shame, maybe impending doom over here, and I'm just absolutely in total misery, and I don't know what to do. I've got pain, I've got guilt, and then impending doom. How do I find meaning from all of that? Well, you know, he says that you need to turn this suffering into some kind of feeling of achievement or accomplishment. Like you're enduring stuff that a lot of people could never endure. So you try to make something positive of this. I am suffering at the hands of this narcissist, but I'm surviving it. I have survived it to this place, and a lot of people might not be able to do that. When I have guilt or shame with this, then I, I see that if I have it, 
it's kind of an invitation to change some things so I'm not doing the thing I did that I don't like, made me feel guilty, or produce shame. And then this impending doom or this sense of death or whatever, I need to do whatever I can to add meaning to my life on this very day. So I've got to have a support group. I've got to have friends that I can trust, safe people that I can go to. Well, let me read you from, from Viktor Frankl himself. He wrote this. He wrote about tragic optimism. He says, let us first ask ourselves, what should be, the, be, under, be understood by a tragic optimism? In brief, it means that one is and remains optimistic in spite of this tragic triad consisting of pain, guilt, and death. This raises the question, how is it possible say, to say yes to life in spite of all that that I'm going through? How can life retain its potential meaning in spite of its tragic aspects? Well, after all, saying yes to life in spite of everything, that's, that presupposes that life is potentially meaningful under any condition, even those which are most miserable. And this, is in turn, this in turn presupposes the human capacity to create, creatively turn life's negative aspects into something positive or constructive. In other words, what matters is to make the best of any given situation. Hence the reason I speak of a tragic optimism. An optimism in the face of tragedy and in view of the human potential, which at its best always allows for turning suffering into a human achievement and deriving uh, from guilt the opportunity to change oneself for the better and deriving from life's trans transitoriness as an incentive to take responsible action today. So what he's saying is, rather than wallow in misery, looking for happiness, I find meaning, I bring meaning to my life out of the misery and in the misery and then I have an opportunity to be happy or experience peace something like that I think of slavery in America and I think of, of just this how I would feel with no way out no hope and constant mistreatment it's miserable Yet some of the greatest hymns ever came out of that time. And some of the greatest acts of love and the greatest music, the, the spirituals, they're my, my favorites because people found meaning in the midst of misery. Now, so that's what I want for you. I want you to have a therapist. I want you to have a support group. I want you to have a plan where you're working on a different way of approaching this, even if this other person never, ever changes one single thing. That's what I want for you. So that's my take on narcissism. So much more in the book, Understanding and Loving a Person with Narcissism. If a person has ever said to you, you're a narcissist, they might be wrong. If two people say you're a narcissist, you might want to think about that. Because if somebody says I'm a horse, I'm going to ignore them. Two people say I'm a horse, I'm, I'm going to consider it. Three people say I'm a horse, maybe I should buy a saddle. And so if three people are saying, hey, I think you got a problem here, maybe you could deal with it. You could start with this understanding and loving a person with narcissistic personality disorder because although people think you love yourself when you're a narcissist you actually don't you're pretty miserable about yourself thank you for joining me for this going deeper time i hope it's helpful if it is tell somebody else to tune in and i'm going to see you here again uh, tomorrow on finding a deeper way to get to the truth about our lives finding a way to get to a deeper relationship with christ and have deeper meaning in all areas of life. God bless you. See you next time. Bye-bye.